Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined, as always, by my trusted colleague, Weston Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. Wes, our second draft recap show. And uh, you put together an interesting little piece for Packers.com the other day um, where you sort of dug out through whether it was through the interviews over draft weekend or the the bio information that we got on the players but one extra interesting little thing about each of the Packers 11 draft picks that didn't quite work into our coverage over the weekend so if uh if you want to learn a little bit more about these guys check that out on packers.com but help me feed my family yeah of those of those various uh of those various items um, what uh, one or ones stood out to you? So first off, the main, my main idea for doing this, we're always just looking for stuff to get us through the week before the rookie orientation camp. And my, my biggest prompt for this was, I thought the scouts last weekend were phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, everybody that talked had something interesting to say, but because of the calamity and chaos of the draft, you and I only get to write so much about it. You did an excellent job of incorporating John Eric Sullivan's voice into your final recap story. I thought John Eric had probably one of the best press conferences of the entire weekend. That, that was, as I, I mentioned uh, in Insider Inbox, actually, that was my favorite press conference. No yeah. offense to anybody else. That was my favorite press conference of the entire weekend was, uh, was listening to John Eric kind of dig into the Packers process a little bit and really talk about what they're looking for and and uh, with regard to these prospects. So, uh, yeah, I tried to incorporate those comments in my wrap-up story. And, uh, and if you want to check out the video of that press conference, by all means, it's on the website as well. And for me, I'm not John Eric's agent, but I would take that 14-minute press conference and I would show it to every NFL team that is looking for a general manager one year from now. I thought yeah. it was very uh, presidential in that way or general managerial ishal in that way (laughs) be that as it may you're asking me about the top 11 things to know about these 11 prospects the two things that I enjoyed the most um, this wasn't anything like an epiphany but the Packers drafted yet another Georgia Bulldog digging into that a little bit with Javon Ballard coming in that's the fourth time in four drafts the Packers have drafted four Georgia Bulldogs obviously doubling up two years ago with Devontae White and Quay Walker Prior to selecting Eric Stokes, though, the Packers had actually selected the last time they had four Bulldogs that they got through the draft. It had been, I believe, 58 years. Uh, it had taken <laughs> as far as how many times they drafted him, including Jarius Wynn in 2009. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One, I think that shows just where Kirby Smart has taken this program and the level that he's put it on. Uh, you know, Mark Rick was there. They've obviously had success in the past. But, I mean, this we are talking about one of the top programs in the country now, and they're getting some of the top recruits, and they're developing them. Bellardio is hopefully going to be the next one of that. Uh, in the fourth round, Evan Williams, I had to laugh. There was nowhere to put it in our coverage yeah. on Saturday. But 10 years after the Green Bay Packers draft Richard Rodgers, whose father and namesake was involved in the play, the Cal Stanford game, they go and take Evan Williams. The band Williams. is on the field. The band is on the field. <laughs> they take Evan Williams, whose father was also on the field uh, for Cal. That's incredible. It's it it's it, that's a it's amazing. I and uh, we were, we were talking about this before, um, before we turned the cameras on. I mean, you know, 1982 Cal versus Stanford, the game that is the big rivalry in the Bay Area in Northern California, and uh, um, I mean. In this day and age of instant replay, that <laughs> that play would have that play would have meant absolutely nothing for if, for those I'm sure many of you have seen it, if not all of you. Um, there are uh, there's you know the one guy's knees hit the ground before he laterals the ball, and then th- this is this is the part. This is the part I the love. Though. A good story. <laughs> this is this is the part I love though when you look back at it because because these are the things. These are the things that are now that are now caught by instant replay that our eyes don't necessarily catch in the moment and it's it's when when somebody is running somebody is running full speed and they lateral the ball um it's an optical illusion to us that the ball is not moving forward yeah. but it actually is because if you look at you know if somebody is running forward and then they lateral the ball the ball is going to end up further down the field than where the player released it so technically that's a forward lateral and it would be illegal on a on a kickoff return yeah. right um 
but in in the moment, in the moment, it looks legit, right? Yeah. It looks it looks like oh no, he didn't throw it. He like didn't throw it forward. Trick. So, um, but there there are a couple of those like in the Cal Stanford play and everything. But uh, yeah, I I uh, I about fell out of my chair when Evan Williams said, you know, when when he was asked, so was, it, was it Matt Schneidman yeah. from the Athletic who asked him about uh, about his dad being uh, being involved in the play? The, uh, the kickoff return the, in the Cal Stanford game with the trombone player getting run over. This is the quote I love too. Once or twice a month we're, where we're pulling it up or it's on TV somewhere. Yeah. It's like you can't even escape it either. It's, yeah. all, it's omnipresent. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, there. it's there forever. Well, another thing I wanted to, I wanted to get your thoughts on, because obviously on our, on our last show we talked about all these, uh, all these Packer picks and all the implications and how the Packers went about putting together this collection of rookies but we didn't talk much at all about what was going on in the rest of the NFC North. And, uh, and this, is, this is a draft that, for one reason or another, is going to be remembered as far as the NFC North is, is concerned because two of the four teams, the Bears and the Vikings, both drafted their quarterbacks of the future with the Bears taking Caleb Williams again the I thought worst you're going to say specialist again, the worst kept secret no we'll, we'll uh I'll let you talk about <laughs> the you. Bears punter if you want to later <laughs> um yeah. the Bears taking Caleb Williams number 1 overall and then the Vikings sweating things out at the 11th pick and then ultimately moving up one spot to into the number 10 spot to get JJ McCarthy because they were they weren't sure there was the obviously the possibility that the Broncos or the Raiders might trade up into the number 10 spot with, was it the Jets? Had yep. The, yeah. the Jets had the 10th spot. Well, according to um, Sean Payton, he was so, involved in like 18 trades that day. But, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's all, all kinds of things But going they wanted on. Bo Nix. But it was interesting because a lot of people asked the question, well, why, like, why would they, the Jets aren't going to take a quarterback. Why are the Vikings trading up one spot? The, the Jets have Aaron Rodgers. They're not going to take a quarterback. Well, it's because they don't know if somebody else might jump in front of them and trade for that number 10 pick yeah. and get, uh, who many uh, thought was really the the last of the of the first round quarterbacks in uh, JJ McCarthy, or certainly the guy that the that the Vikings wanted. I think after Drake May was taken by the Patriots, when the Patriots wouldn't trade out of the number three spot, Elliot Wolf uh, sticking at three and taking May from North Carolina. Just your thoughts on kind of how the the top of that first round unfolded with all the quarterbacks, and then not no trade was made until the tenth spot when we were discussing the previous week. You know, are the Pages going to trade at three? The Cardinals going to trade at four? The Chargers going to trade at five? Everybody sat and picked, and then the other interesting part of that is the Giants sitting at number six did not take a quarterback. Yeah, they ended up going with a wide receiver. Yeah, they did, and. First and foremost, uh, I don't do this just because of the Packer connections. I, I do this because I thought he, he did a whale of a job in his first NFL draft in the, the Catbird seat there. And Elliot Wolf, dude, f- New England need to switch up their offense. Uh, they go their first five picks. They go on the offensive side of the ball. It starts with Drake May. Not that you want stuff leaking out. I know how NFL franchises feel about that, but I actually was really – I thought that made the Patriots look great in terms of what Minnesota was trying to give up to move there, and it's showing just how dedicated Elliott was to Drake May and this being the next guy. Yeah, he he absolutely had, he absolutely was, King's was convinced that uh, that that Drake May has got to be their guy because if the reports that were out there are true, uh, Elliott Wolf passed up some very very attractive trades to trade out of the number three spot, and he did not want to do it, which shows you. Uh, how he feels about Drake May as the Patriots. So the Chicago back. Bears obviously go with Caleb Williams. Um, they go with the receiver at nine. And now you wait and see. Uh, I, I I don't really like Twitter. <laughs> go figure. <laughs> um, I know Bear fans are talking about the new era and everything like that. We've heard that a lot over the last 10 years. Um, maybe Williams is the guy everybody thought he was. But there's going to be that pressure on him now. And seeing how he handles that is going to be very interesting. The, the Packers just so happened to draft his running back in Marshawn Lloyd coming to Green Bay. He had right. very complimentary things to say about him as well. But I don't think there's been a more celebrated, decorated number one overall pick. I mean, this guy put him up there against Trevor Lawrence and, and Andrew Luck in terms of guys that are just expected to come in and be MVP type players. Yeah. Uh, the Bears have everything staked to him. They did not pick very much in this draft. 
they they you know everyone talks about all the additions they made in free agency and through trades and that well they had to yeah. they didn't have the equity to be able to do that through the draft so and they even they even gave up a future draft pick to get back into this yes. draft to take an additional player because after the first round when they took Williams at number one they took their wide receiver uh, Rome Adunze from, yeah, from Washington. Washington at number nine the Bears only had two other picks in the entire draft and they sacrificed a pick next year to get another player uh, for this year. If the cupboard's bare, you got to put some groceries in it, right? Do. So, I mean, that, that's what they did. Uh, Minnesota, I mean, I don't want to say you're all in, but this is it. This was the move. Uh, this was the draft where they, they made some big moves. And, and certainly when you look at it, I know Dallas Turner, is a, I think he's already the favorite for Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, defensive rookie rookie of the, of the year. year excuse me yes defensive rookie of the year yeah. um, so they still felt like they helped their defense but the J.J. McCarthy move was one I, I told you going into the draft I mean I not that I knew this everybody knew this the Vikings had to draft a quarterback yeah you had to get one and with where they were sitting uh, you were in that that you know is is Penix going to be there is it McCarthy is McCarthy going to go higher you know, Bo Nix, I think everybody kind of assumed would be in that range, but is he the guy? And if you're taking six quarterbacks in the top 12, how good do you feel about the sixth guy actually being the best of the bunch? Maybe not great. Yeah. Uh, J.J. McCarthy ends up being the guy. They have Sam Darnold. That doesn't mean he has to play right away, but so much is staked to this change at quarterback. And, and I'm not trying to put together an ad campaign for how the Packers develop quarterbacks in contrast to what has been the situation in Minnesota now for many years. But when you don't have a quarterback, it makes the job a lot more difficult. And they finally made the decision, you know what? We paid Kirk Cousins a lot of money for a lot of years. He got them to a certain point, but they couldn't get past that point. So now we're going to kind of try to rebuild while still competing. And the one danger I feel is there for the Vikings is the number one overall pick, the guy that was just talking about how celebrated he's been and Caleb Williams goes to a division team. Another division team was in the NFC Championship game, and then you have the Green Bay Packers, who were the hottest team in football during the final month of the season. Yeah, The Vikings don't have a lot of room there to pace themselves. They kind of have to catch up if they're going to stay in this thing, and this was their move. Well, and what, what's interesting to me, and, and I mean, who knows whether J.J. McCarthy is ultimately going to be the guy or not, um, but what's interesting to me is how we keep hearing out of Minnesota that – that they're going to be patient. They're going to, you know, they're going to bring JJ McCarthy along slowly, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's all fine and good to say right now, but the guy you have starting at quarterback, presumably week one, will be Sam Darnold, who has, I believe, it's like a twenty-something and thirty-seven record as a starting quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. Um, if you do start out with Sam Darnold because you're going to bring J.J. McCarthy along slowly and not put all this pressure on him, well, then what happens when you lose a few games? It's 21 and 35, by the way. 21 and 35, yeah. thank you. 21 and 35 as a starting quarterback. You start losing some games, you know, I mean, the fans pay good money to, 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 pay, to buy the tickets and to come out and support the team. And, uh, you know, if the Vikings do start out losing some games, there's going to be a lot of pressure to put J.J. McCarthy in there and, and for, the Vikings to, uh, for the Vikings to show their fans what they have. Are they going to resist that? I mean, what, is, what will be the decision-making process down the line? Now, maybe Sam Darnold, you know, maybe this is the reclamation of his career. We saw it with Geno Smith in yeah. Seattle. You can't rule it out, Never right? Can. Not going to rule it out. But the Vikings are the Vikings are potentially going to be in a really tough spot here. The pressure for the fans, is, I'm, I'm with you on that. That is 100% correct. But you've also the strength of your football team right now is your receiving core. Yep. You have arguably the best receiver in the game right now in Justin Jefferson. Jordan Addison showed a lot of nice things last year as well. You need a guy that's going to be able to feed those players. Kirk Cousins, people can talk about primetime Kirk, you know, or you want to talk about the playoff Kirk, but he got the ball out into those guys' hands. He yep. allowed them to make plays. Yep. That's the biggest switch they're going with because when I was talking about this – Minnesota's almost kind of been, I mean, you, you heard that stat about how few first-round quarterbacks they've ever drafted. You know, they hit on Dante Culpepper, but then injuries became an issue for him. And then after that, it was just sort of plug-and-play guys other than Christian Ponder. Yeah, they drafted, they drafted Christian Ponder with a first-round pick. I believe he was 12th overall. Yep. But quite frankly, the only, the only year they did anything with Christian Ponder was when Adrian Peterson was the league MVP with a 2,000-yard 
rushing season in 2012. Yep. That was the only year with Christian Ponder that 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 they went anywhere. So you're right. There there's been there there's been this interesting history with Minnesota and how they've gone about it. At yeah. So it, this is where it's going to get really interesting. This division. I I love what Detroit did again. I, I thought they had some really savvy picks in this thing. They moved around. They helped their defense some. Uh, I, I, I again, Brad Holmes, John Dorsey. I tip my cap to them. I felt like as soon as John came on board there too, and obviously Brad's track record speaks for itself. They've done it. There, it's not a, it's not a mystery why they were in the NFC Championship game. They've drafted really, really well these last few years, beginning in 2021 with Amon Ross St. Brown in the fourth round. Brian Branch gets involved. It looks like Aiden Hutchinson is going to be a player. So the competition in the North, I think, is going to be really strong this year. Now, fortunately for everybody, there's seven playoff spots now in the NFC. If you want to get in on this party, there are tickets to go. Yeah. Uh, but but certainly uh, for the Packers, for Minnesota, for all these teams, you have to put yourself in a p- position to compete, neutralize the other team's strengths, and uh, see where it takes you. Yeah. What'd you think of uh, what'd you think of Detroit's move? Uh, essentially, using two picks because they traded up to get the cornerback from Alabama, Terry and Arnold. Yeah. Good. Uh, the the one thing that you knew and I talked about it afterwards. Between him and, and Rakestraw, they got two of the top corners in the draft, but yeah. also two of the guys that tested slower when you're looking at more of those 40 yeah, times. Yeah, looking at the 40 times. So if that's the identity of their defense, if they're going to go press man and play physical, which, I mean, to a certain extent, that is what you're expecting. That's that, that's Dan Campbell. That's so. Dan Campbell. That You know, that's – um you know um, oh, why is his name escaping me right now? The defensive coordinator over there. Um, Aaron Glenn. T- thank you, Aaron Glenn. Right? Yeah. Yes. Aaron Glenn. Defensive backs. Yeah. Smash mouth in your face. When they've turned this corner with their personnel, that's the identity they've tried to keep for really the last two and a half years now. So, yeah, I think it in a lot of ways it made sense for them. Uh, I felt like offensively they've built out that offensive line so well. They've hit on their draft picks at the skill positions. I mean, I, you would not, if you bring back, if Justin wants to bring up the old clips of uh, you know our pre-draft stuff last year, I was not sold on Sam Laporta. I thought he was a little too small. I knew the history there with Iowa tight ends, but you had all these really big, you know, the six foot six, six foot five guys in this thing. Sam Laporta was as good as anyone in that draft last year and made a huge difference in that in that offense. So uh, it'll be fascinating to watch how this develops for Detroit. But this was a as much as we talk about this being an important draft for the Packers because you've had two really good ones back to back and you're trying to put that third one together to make a Super Bowl run. The Lions are sitting in the same seat. Yeah. Um- one last thought I want to get from you with regard to the first round of the draft because a lot of people are talking about it as you Remember, know. Remember, wasn't it cute by the way when I said Michael Penix would go in the first round or not? Yeah. And he went at eight. Sorry to interrupt. No, but. and that's exactly what I was <laughs> going to bring up because that is that is the move where people are talking about okay, you know the the sort of the the Packers blueprint for quarterback succession, right? The yeah. Falcons went out. Things didn't work out with Desmond Ritter, who they drafted a couple years back in the third round. They the, the Falcons had been using their first round picks. They had three consecutive years of top ten picks, and they took a tight end, a wide receiver, and a running back. They did not draft a quarterback. Um, they did not draft a, a premium position. They didn't go left tackle or edge rusher or or corner. They went with the they went with the flashy offensive players. But then with a third round quarterback, it didn't happen. It yeah. didn't get done. So they went out. Spent a bunch of money to get Kirk Cousins. Um, perhaps broke some rules along the way, but we'll find <laughs> out. We'll find out about that with when the league's tampering investigation is complete, oh, which apparently Lord. it's not yet. Yeah. But they go out and sign Kirk Cousins to a whole bunch of money. They guarantee him somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred million dollars. But then they have another top ten pick this year, and they use it on a quarterback in Michael Penix Jr. from Washington with the idea that he will sit, I think, for a minimum of three years, but at least a minimum of two years, he will sit behind Kirk Cousins, watch and learn, and then eventually get the keys to the car. I mean, the Falcons have a reasonable out cap-wise on Cousins' contract after three years. They sign him to a four-year deal. They have a reasonable out after three years, but I, I think... I think that it's going to have to go those three years before you turn it over to Penix. Otherwise, you're putting yourself in salary cap jail when you're trying to turn things over to a new quarterback, and that just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I'm going to answer this in several different ways. The first one is to all the haters out there that were talking about, well, why didn't they go defense? Because the Falcons need to figure out their offense first before we can even – yeah, okay, their defense isn't great, fine. Their offense wasn't great. Yeah. And – 
the only part that I laugh at that I, I actually giggled when I saw, you know, Penix come off the board at eight was for all that time, they didn't give Arthur Smith a single quarterback. Yeah. They fire him <laughs> and then they spend all this money on Kirk Cousins and they use the eighth overall pick on Penix. I, that was pretty humorous to me. Not to say that they would have drafted another one and it would have worked out, but it was just funny that they never actually had that guy. They were trying to roll with a third round rook, you know, third former third round pick. Yeah. So that being said, I actually really like the pick. Uh, I, I think too. that this is the. If you have an administration, and you have an owner that can be understanding and see a little bit past just what's directly in front of them and what you could potentially do. This was the move for the Falcons because with all due respect to Kirk Cousins, he has only gotten to a certain point in his NFL career as a starting quarterback. He's not any younger and he's coming off an Achilles tear. Made total sense that they did whatever they had to do to sign him. But Penix is a guy that you've heard so many people talk about his arm strength being generational, talking like, you know, this is a guy that, you know, maybe Matthew Stafford-esque type strength and his ability to deliver a football. Yeah. If you can give that coaching staff time to bring him along and not throw him into the fire like we've done so often Mike yes CJ Stroud last year was an exciting football player and he it looks like he's going to be a, a real playmaker for years to come I can't see any scenario in which Bryce Young benefited from what happened last year in no, Carolina exactly that, nothing that that's the thing it's it's you, you throw you throw these young guys into the fire right away sometimes you get you know a Joe Burrow yep. or a CJ Stroud and sometimes you get Bryce Young. I mean, and and it's not it's not necessarily about the guy. It's about it's about the environment. It's about the situation. It's about the status of the the rest of the team as a whole. Mike McCarthy always used to say, "It's not about whether a young quarterback is ready to play. It's about whether the team is ready for the young quarterback yeah. to play." And so not some of these some of these guys that. just get thrown into situations that that. Uh, that are really, really difficult, and the Falcons are going to do their best. The Vikings, it sounds like, are going to try that as well. The Falcons are going to do their best to avoid that, and the difference between the two situations is the Falcons spent a lot of money on a veteran quarterback who has taken teams to the playoffs before, as opposed to the Vikings, who, you know, their their guy right now is a guy who hasn't won in the NFL. Can I, I mean, you're absolutely right, but I was thought I really thought you were going to go with the difference is is the Falcons paid Kirk Cousins and the Vikings did not pay Kirk Cousins. Yeah. After all that, I mean that's that's certainly that's certainly true but, as well. But but here's the thing, and, and this is where this would be my last point on this, and this is the, the 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 thing I wanted to hit on the most, where the Green Bay Packers have outdone the rest of the National Football League is they've caught the league sleeping on quarterbacks at the right time. They caught the NFL sleeping on Aaron Rodgers in 2005. They caught the league sleeping on Jordan Love in 2020. Right. You are not going to be able to find franchise quarterbacks every year past that number 10, 15 spot. There's just teams are moving up. They're trying to make things happen. The Packers' ability to do that, I don't – when people try to make this comparison, well, they spent so high to get Penix. Yeah, because that's normally what teams have exactly. to do. Exactly. That, that, is, that is what you have to do. And, and that was part of when the Falcons' head coach and, and general manager were answering questions about the Penix pick – they were saying, hey, we spent a bunch of money on Kirk Cousins, but we know we're going to need a quarterback down the line. We're not expecting to end up with a top 10 pick with Kirk Cousins as our quarterback. You're going to be back. So, right, you're going to be further back in the first round. So if we're looking at the quarterback of the future, we have to get him now while we have the high pick because we're planning to be picking in the 20s or later because of what we're paying Kirk Cousins to do for the franchise. And I, the last point I'll make about that 2020 draft, people always say, well, you know, T. Higgins was still available, Patrick Queen was still available, but Denzel Mims was also still available. I took Ross Blacklock in one of my mock drafts that year he ended up going at 40 and he's out of the league at 25 right you never know the Packers knew they had something there with Jordan Love there was a good scouting report on him we listened to Sam Seal last weekend talking about you know he had a he had a hand in looking at at Love as well when you feel good about guys when we talk about best player available and all that stuff and it's not always true in terms of you know if you're not going to Packers were not going to draft a quarterback this year they didn't right. need to in the first round or second round but the, the truth is, is when you build that board, as you talked about on our last show, you bake it into the cake and you see what's all available to you. I, I think that's the most exciting thing. And if I'm an Atlanta Falcons fan, 
I don't care about the fact that Cousins was signed and Penix was drafted at number eight. I care about the fact that finally I feel like I have a quarterback. I have multiple quarterbacks, and there's a reason to believe again because, Mike, I think Atlanta was the number one example of if you don't have a guy, whether it was trying to bring in Marcus Mariota or doing the Desmond Ritter experiment or all this thing, all these different things they've done since, Matthew, since Matt Ryan left. Right. Um, you're going to fall into that kind of purgatory in the league and you're not going to be high enough to get a top guy and you're also not going to be And it doesn't, enough. and if you don't have that guy, it doesn't matter what you put around him. Yep. They were trying to do it by putting the best possible playmakers around that guy, but if, but if that guy is not the guy, it's, it's not, it's not going to work. You can give me Kobe steak, Mike. I'm not going to be able to do much with it. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like if you can have the best ingredients possible, but you have to, some, you have to have somebody that's going to cook with it. I'll just say quickly, too, with regard to the 2020 draft, Patrick Queen was the guy that I really liked, yeah. and I was disappointed the Packers did not take him. But And Patrick Queen's a solid NFL player, but the Ravens didn't even bring him back on a second contract. He's, he became a free agent and went and signed somewhere else. And I bet you got pretty excited when ESPN threw up that comparison graphic for Adrian Cooper, too. Patrick Queen. <laughs> there we go. Whom the Packers were able to get at 45 overall. Yeah, there we go. That's the game. A little bit of sponsor business here. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousins Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl, Cousins Subs, 50-plus years of better. Um, Last thing before we go, Wes, rookie minicamp is this weekend. The players are actually arriving in Green Bay today, going through all sorts of orientation stuff, physicals, get their equipment, get, you know, their shoes, their helmet, their, all kinds of stuff, figure out where they get food, you know, learn the building a little bit. Um, we will get a chance to talk to players in the locker room on Friday. We'll also get a chance to watch um, some of the first practice on Friday. Just quickly, your uh, your approach, your thoughts on kind of what you like to keep your eye on during this rookie mini camp. Two things I always enjoy watching is one, seeing who the tryout players end up being. There always ends up being a name or two that you don't expect uh, that ends up being involved with it. And then occasionally you find a Lucas Patrick out of this bunch that ends up being a player for you. The undrafted process does not just begin and end immediately after the draft. It'll keep going on. Uh, another guy that speaks to that is Emmanuel Wilson last year, starting with Denver, getting cut, ending up with Green Bay, makes a 53-man roster. Right. That's always neat to see. But the other thing I enjoy about it, it's not going to be overly competitive. You're not going to see guys, you know, there's going to be no scuffles. There'll be nothing like that. Everyone will be on their best behavior. And the Packers are mostly just going to want to get these guys growing accustomed to what they're going to expect when they come back for OTAs in the format of those practices. But it's always neat when you can see the athleticism of these guys. And that's really all you're going to be able to see. You're going to be able to see the speed. You're going to be able to see the way they catch the ball. Or in Michael Pratt's case, the way he throws the ball. Yeah. That, that to me is where it's the first time you get eyes on these guys because you can look at their highlights, you can, you can see their bios and all the things that they accomplished in college, but this is the first time you actually get to see the players in the semi-uniform and kind of going about their process. And I, it, it's a weird thing because, you know, we do like a bunch of interviews and then we watch the practice, then Matt will talk, and then we'll watch another practice. So you only learn so much, but... I think it gives you a, a definite feel. Like, for example, the first time we saw Lucas Van Ness, you're like, oh, okay, well, this is why this guy was drafted 13th overall. Yeah, this He looks is, like this a Greek why, god. Right, right. Yeah, looking at it, it's, it's always interesting to me looking at just uh, getting a chance to see what they look like physically on the field with their helmet on, even though they're not in pads. You know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, shorts and helmets. But seeing what they look like physically when when okay this isn't this isn't your college team anymore this is more the cream of the crop of the college guys even when you're talking the tryout guys yep. who don't have a contract those are still the guys who were you know the cream of the crop in college not it's not just you know 85 scholarship players on one sideline um, but then the other thing that always that always strikes me is uh, is just watching some of the fundamental stuff like. How do guys catch the ball? I mean, you know, I'll, I'll never forget. It, it's always stood out to me. The 2013 rookie minicamp, one of the things, and for whatever reason that day, I don't know exactly why, but the Packers were doing, were doing all kinds of uh, punt and punt return drills in that rookie minicamp practice. And Micah Hyde is back there fielding punts. Yep. And, 
you know, he, he looked, he looked as natural and as smooth and easy catching all, you know, these wobbly punts and everything else as anybody I'd ever seen as a rookie. It's just, you, you look at that guy and you go, yeah, that's there. There, that's a baller, you know, like there was nothing that was going to phase that guy. And, uh, and sure enough, he was just a rookie fifth round pick out of Iowa who ran too slow yep. at the time. And, uh, and we all know what, uh, what he became for both the Packers and the Buffalo Bills. So those are the kinds of things that, uh, that are always interesting Some people to just watch look like here. And, it, and it's just, it's such a brief introduction. You know, they get, they get the playbook and they get, you know, I don't know, a half a dozen or a dozen plays just to, you know, they, they get a, a quarterback like Michael Pratt to just learn how to spit out a couple of different plays in the huddle and, uh, and to get everybody on the same page and whatnot. Because as you said, the next, the next step then is toward the end of this month when the OTAs begin, they're thrown in there with all the veterans. And then it's like, okay, this is, is going to be a real non-padded but a real NFL practice that these guys are going to be in, um, and, uh, and they get you know three, four weeks of that, including the mini camp in the middle of June. And one other thing to mention, too, just very quickly with Michael Pratt, because, yeah, OTAs are going to come around, and it'll be just like training camp where it's predominantly Jordan Love, and Sean Clifford will get some snaps as well. But, you know, as we learned, uh, you know, I think it was yesterday, you know, Alex Magoo is going to be making the switch over to receiver now. So Michael Pratt is sitting in that number three spot. Uh, that means that you're not going to be the fourth guy up. You're going to be the third guy up. Yeah. So if you, you know, if trickle things coming down and trickle to your OTAs, you have to be ready for that moment. It sounds like the young man has that disposition about him. But it, again, one of the reasons why, when you think of like Sean Clifford jumping in the way he did, or even Tim Boyle back in 2018, yeah, they set that tone right from the beginning of the OTAs to make their case for making a roster, for right. being the number two quarterback. And all the every opportunity matters. So even even if it is, you know, if you don't really recognize anybody right away, you're trying to just figure things out while you're out there. It's all it's all reviewed. It's all graded, and ultimately that's how you start yeah. setting a depth chart as you get into training camp. Yeah, nobody wins or loses any jobs any jobs during the uh, rookie minicamp, except maybe the tryout guys, of course. Or us. But I'm talking about the draft picks and the undrafted guys who have already signed. Nobody wins or loses any jobs during the rookie minicamp, but first impressions do matter and that and and these guys know that yeah and and it's exciting too because there's very few times where you and i will go out there and it's just you're looking at a completely new football team uh there, you know there'll usually be like what maybe 40 between 35 50 guys that are out there on the field depending on how big the ufa class is and how many returning veterans are eligible to play participate in it but uh it's 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 again it's setting out the books and pens and papers for the first day of school. Mm -hmm. It's another step towards getting back towards the season and ultimately figuring out if any of these 11 guys can make the impact that, you know, that draft class did a year ago. Absolutely. Well, on our next show, we will share some of our first impressions with regard to the rookie minicamp. But for now, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team. Everything with regard to rookie minicamp that we have access to, we will cover it to the best of our ability on Packers.com. For Wes, I am Mike. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We will see you next time.